How does a man with no ID and no transportation get from upstate New York to northern California? It's more than 4,500 kilometers as the crow flies. But that is the mystery officials are trying to solve after a missing Toronto firefighter turned up in Sacramento six days after disappearing while skiing near Lake Placid. The latest on a mysterious case doesn't appear to be anywhere close to being solved. Investigators are still trying to figure out how a skier who claims he got caught in a snowstorm in New York ended up in California. New York State Police have interviewed the skier who disappeared from Whiteface Mountain and ended up across the country, but we still don't know what happened. 49-year-old Constantinos Danny Filipitas, a fire captain in Toronto, told police he was on a ski trip in New York with friends out in the Adirondacks. He went out for one last run and says he got caught in a storm and he believes he hit his head. Then somehow he ended up in a big rig, he says, going to the West Coast. In the meantime, investigators say none of the big rig companies and drivers they've spoken to remember taking him anywhere. Police found him in Sacramento, about 3,000 miles from here. At the time, he had already gotten a new haircut, cash, and a new iPhone. Troopers say they plan on speaking with him again. Now, several news groups have tried calling barber shops in Sacramento near the area where the skier was located, but they too have not found out who cut his hair. More details are emerging in the mysterious case of the Toronto firefighter missing in New York State and then found in California. And we spoke to a Sacramento police officer today and he describes this case as an odd one. In fact, he says in 18 years he's never seen anything like it. The small community of St. John has been stunned with the perplexing disappearance of a retired attorney from the Isle of Man. Mark Maroney, a resident of St. John, has been missing since Sunday evening from his home in the Chocolate Hole area of St. John. According to reports, Maroney went outside of his home around 8 p.m. to retrieve a flashlight from his car during a power outage, but he has not been seen since. The Virgin Islands Police Department discovered the deceased body of an older man in a steep, heavily wooded area of St. John at about 3.55 p.m. on Friday, the 23rd of February. The body was clothed in a pants type similar to that of missing St. John resident Mark Maroney. Every month, in almost every state, people go into the wilderness and don't come out. Stories like that are what fuel David Politis. Forever rifling newspaper archives and badgering federal agencies for public records, he's discovered more than 400 cases of people who wandered into the wilderness but never came back. Now, there are so many missing kids in Oregon, it's ridiculous. Accounts of children, people, vanishing, seemingly swallowed up by the many endless forests across America, or even later found in ways that defy logic. But still at a loss to explain what happened to 49-year-old veteran firefighter Danny Philippidis. He was skiing at Whiteface with some friends last Wednesday and simply disappeared, only to reappear in Sacramento today. Now, have you heard anything about how he ended up there? It's a very unusual story. I know that they've been not been able to get a lot from him. He does seem uh, very confused. They're trying to figure out what was in his backpack and where he come from and everything. And the guy was pretty confused. Like he didn't know where, where he was at or what, how he got here. These are questions authorities in New York State now try to answer too. He came to Sacramento. Um, on a big rig. However, he could not provide uh, the description of the big rig or the description of the big rig driver. And he believed that he was a passenger in that big rig and was dropped off here in the Sacramento area. Filipita said he believed he had sustained a head injury and could recall very little of the last six days. Another thing that we um, thought was odd, uh, but seemed to match the circumstances of which he provided, uh, was he was wearing winter boots, uh, snow pants, um, a heavy jacket as to be used for skiing, and a helmet uh, that would also be used for skiing. 
Now, police have released this photo taken recently to see if they can jog anyone's memory. He was wearing the same ski clothes he apparently went missing in, but he tells officials that he was not flying. He didn't fly in here, but investigators say that he had very little recollection of the last several days. But he told authorities he didn't fly here. He said that he was dropped off by a truck driver, um, said he slept a lot during the trip here and did not have uh, a huge recollection as to uh, how he got from A to B. Deputies say Filipitas was still wearing the same ski clothes he wore when he was reported missing, but he had no obvious signs of trauma. He was adamant that he was not the victim of any crime. A missing skier found thousands of miles away, relieved, but what exactly happened? No one knows yet. These were unusual things that don't make sense that happened to cluster together, cluster together in three to four, sometimes as many as 20, 30 people missing at one location. He's mapped out what appear to be more than 30 clusters of vanishings in forests and national parks coast to coast. Some of those clusters and cases right here in Oregon. All of them documented and described in his two books. According to Oregon State Police, there are 41 missing children in Oregon. And now also in the movie Missing 411, releasing in a couple of months. In a lot of these cases, search and rescue or the volunteers searching people have already gone over certain areas, not once, not twice, but even dozens of times. And then the child is found there maybe a year, maybe a few years later. The search coordinators themselves are baffled by it too the ones they don't think is criminal in nature. While the retired ranger can name every plant and creature, his real talent is tracking. My grandmother taught me to look for the white. She says, follow the white. But it's where the child or the adult stepped on it and it's real fresh. One of the top man trackers in the nation, McCarter has assisted in more than a hundred searches in the Smokies, but it's the first person in his logbook that's never been found. Every Father's Day, the Martin family, the extended family, would go to Spence Field and camp. It was June 14th in the summer of 69 when six-year-old Dennis Martin, his brother and friends, planned a playful prank. They hatched the idea of going and scaring the family who were setting up on this hill. The boys split, Dennis heading one direction alone. The three boys scared the family and Dennis never showed up. What followed is believed to be the largest search in park history. The search area has expanded as the days stretch into a full week since the youngster was reported missing. They amassed a whole lot of people, hundreds and hundreds of people. The U.S. Army with big Chinook helicopters. Fresh out of the military himself, the young McCarter joined boots on the ground. Each day as the search expanded, he believes the chances of finding Dennis diminished. It messed up all the tracks. If, if you're a tracker, that's the worst thing for you to do. Nature created its own complications. And then it come this terrible rain, pouring and pouring and pouring. Every year, hundreds of people are reported missing in national parks and forests, many of them children, and most are eventually found whether dead or alive, but a small percentage of the cases, some right here in Oregon, are never solved. The mystery those cases present has one man wondering if there's a common denominator behind the disappearances that have search and rescue crews continuing to scratch their heads. Once a cop, Politis got hooked on the inexplicable, intriguing, and mysterious missing persons cases only after a government employee knocked on the door of his hotel near Park Service Land and confided in him, sharing stories about people disappearing at national parks like Crater Lake and Yosemite. The ranger described to me, if you were standing straight up and you just had your shirt, or just had your pants, on and you melted directly into your pants. That's what it looked like to him. The pants were laying on the ground in a very neat pile. Just one of many accounts in his books that leave search crews wondering if they'll ever find closure. And after seven years of research, we found that they replicate themselves in these geographical clusters around the U.S. Cody Sheehy was just six years old when he wandered off deep into the Wallawa wilderness. Search crews and two helicopters with FLIR technology 
couldn't find a trace of him in the rugged woods, dampened by a cold mixed snow and rainfall. In almost all these cases, they bring in helicopters with FLIR, forward-looking infrared radar, to look for heat signatures on the ground. They can't find a heat signature. That's unusual. But the next morning, 15 hours later and 20 miles away, Cody walked up to a house and asked for help. I was physically at the end of my rope that next morning. And if I hadn't been in a situation where people found me at that time, um, I don't know how I would have done for another night out there. I could easily have died. More than 30 years before Cody's harrowing experience, another astonishing story unfolded near Pendleton, where two and a half year old Keith Parkins ran and stumbled over a dozen miles of snow covered timberland and mountains before he was found 19 hours later, stiff and cold, but alive. I mean, to me, being a parent, I can't see my two year old climbing over two mountain ranges in the dark. But that's pretty hard to believe. And there's some cases where little kids are alleged to have walked up to 20 miles overnight or climbed phenomenal heights, three and 4,000 feet. And those are facts and it's highly, highly hard to believe. Yeah, I'm not, not as uh, overly mystical person. Um, I don't think I didn't encounter anything to my memory that was unusual other than the fact that that situation was extremely unusual. So you came to Idaho Falls back in, I think it was October of 2015, and you spoke right. You spoke with uh, Vernal, Dior Coons, Dior's father, Jessica Mitchell, Trina, a few other family and friends, law enforcement. Um, what, what was your take as you came and, and you had studied this case and then you actually got to meet all of the, the people involved? It was, we, we kind of went in the preconceived notion of what we thought we were gonna find. And I think that expectation was flipped on its head after talking to the family, after going to the campground, after seeing all the pieces um, kind of in their natural habitat, so to speak. And uh, I think Michael and I, Michael's the co-director, were, were uh, even more perplexed when we left than when we got there. But what our, what our goal was from the beginning was to, to get video footage of all of these different elements and to kind of take the audience on the same journey we went on. Um, so to add kind of some visual clarity to the case. Before the film was released, there was a lot of speculation that it was going to be conspiratorial and a lot of uh, theories and, and unproven facts. I've watched the documentary. I didn't see a lot of that. It seemed to just kind of present the story, not a lot of conspiracies thrown in. And then you touched on a few other p cases as well. Tell us about those. Yeah, I mean, definitely our intention was to, to present it in as unloaded and as a proscenium way as possible. We didn't really want to uh, to lead the audience in any way. Um, but yeah, some of the other cases we looked at were uh, Bobby Biza disappeared in the 1950s. In, uh, out of, he was uh, in, in a young boys camp right next to Rocky Mountain National Park. And um, we looked at Jared Adadero, who disappeared in the 90s out of... Uh, uh, the Poudre Canyon in northern Colorado. We looked at uh, a boy who disappeared in northern Oregon and another boy who disappeared in Idaho, <clears throat> out of Idaho. And, you know, it was it was a tough uh, six-month shoot because you, you know you're going to these cases that are, are essentially unexplained. And um, you're talking to family members who are very distraught, who don't have that closure. So to present the fact in that kind of unloaded way was to give the audience the same thing that the family has received. And it's all the information without any of the closure. On Wednesday, February 7th, 2018, 
Constantinos Danny Philippidis, a 49-year-old skier from Toronto, Canada, was reported missing at the Whiteface Mountain Ski Resort in Wilmington, New York. Indicated that he slept a lot along the way, did not recall what the driver looked like. Sergeant Sean Hapton says Philippidis was found in his ski outfit and had his ski helmet. He also had a credit card, new cell phone, nearly $1,000 cash, but no identification. Deontay says right Philippidis here, appeared right to be here, disoriented. Here. When asked to describe a blue sign, he said it was green. They eventually took him to a Yolo County hospital. I heard him say, no, nah, I was sleeping. I just remember sleeping the whole time. That's all I remember him saying. Like, I was sleeping. Philippides has no history of mental illness and police say they had no indication he was on any medication, drugs or alcohol. They said he was still wearing his ski gear um, in California. Uh, can you confirm that and was he also wearing his ski boots? Um, I can confirm that that's what we found him in. It's very similar to yeah. what it was that he was skiing in. I can't comment on anything else. You don't know whether he's wearing his ski boots? I can't comment on that. Um, they said that he was found confused, unable to answer questions about how he got to California. He was, he was actually wearing his ski clothes, and it's very warm in California right now, so I'm just, there's, again, there's a lot of questions tonight. Um, he was receiving medical care after calling his wife, and then they called 911. Uh, the, cap, or the president, excuse me, said that he did not have a history of mental illness or substance abuse. He was found, again, wearing the ski gear, including his helmet and goggles wearing the same thing that he was wearing when he went skiing. He told his friends he was going for one more run here at the mountain. And here we are a week later. Um, officials have not said how he got to Sacramento. Um, they do not believe that he flew though because he didn't have his identification on him. So lots of questions as to how he traveled nearly 3,000 miles um, away from the mountain. Um, during our chat with police yesterday, they told us a lot about the search um, let me flip the camera around. For anyone who may be maybe out of state or out of this region, Whiteface is not an easy mountain. This is an intense mountain. It's very steep. And we've been having, you know, our full scope of winter weather over the last week. Um, crews facing all kinds of conditions, very icy. We had some significant snowfall um, late last week. Police said that they expected there was about two feet of snow from when he was last seen until, of course, now that we've learned that he is okay.